Hello and welcome to another SDA Q&A. Uh, I'm Peter Dixon, your host for today, and my special guests are Steve Daly and Nancy Page. How are you guys? Excellent. Good. And look, I think we're running without a hitch today. No Wi-Fi problems. Um, good image, good audio. Great. Hey, uh, welcome to all our viewers. Apologies that it's a, a different day to normal, but I'm away for a week. And so I've had to bring things forward a little bit. So I was super glad that uh, both Steve and Nancy are flexible and uh, great to have you guys on the program. I've called today's program Can Right and the White Hang on, let me bring it up. Can Right and the White Estate Cover Up. Yes. And uh, I think that's uh, certainly going to get some uh, eyes and ears turning. And uh, there's been a long build-up to this book, Steve. Tell us what inspired you to write it and what the premise of the book is. Well, it, it was interesting when I wrote the psychobiography that, you know, many of my critics were trying to say, oh, this is just regurgitating Can Write. And even though I relied on Can Write very little in writing the psychobiography, that was still kind of the mainstream uh, attack was, oh, he's just regurgitating Can Right, and we've already discredited Can Right, and so this is really a waste of time. Mm. 
I wasn't uh, planning on writing another book, but I met Nancy on the thread, and uh, it was exciting to me to find out she was uh, Carrie Johnson's granddaughter. And the more I learned about that and interviewed her, the more I realized, hey, this is a book in and of itself. And what Arthur White did is just unbelievable, and especially that he got away with it and the church covered for him and the church has promoted that despicable book. Uh, I was Ken Wright's secretary, which, which is an absolute joke now that we know the truth about it. So, um, you know, it was exciting to me to research the whole situation regarding Carrie Johnson, which I'd read her book, but I'd never really researched into her background. And Nancy really provided a lot of awesome uh, information that motivated me to pursue that. And uh, the same was true with Arthur White. I had not uh, looked into Arthur nearly as much as I did once I decided to work on this book. And I'm certainly glad that I did because Arthur White, of course, has been designated the biographer of his grandmother and his six volume biography is considered the official church biography of Ellen White. And now that we know the truth about Arthur, we know how much uh, validity that six volume work has. <laughs> yeah, little, little, I've got, uh, I've got, I was Canwright's secretary here. Yeah. And uh, I had this book years and years ago, um, before I met you, Nancy. And yeah. I remember reading it. And as I read it, I remember thinking, hmm, this is not convincing. <laughs> There's something going on here. And there's two things I've noticed with um, with Adventist apologists. One, they love to attack the, the, the uh, player, not the ball. And the other thing is they love to um, wheel out this kind of material to say yeah. there's nothing to see here. Um, right. You know, with Walter Ray's book, The White Lie, Out Comes the White Truth. Right. Um, which I think you may have said to me, Steve, or someone told me that it was actually written uh, before Walter A's book was released. So they were kind of already <laughs> anticipating this. Um, right. And uh, one thing I've noticed, Steve, and I've been watching closely as you've been um, building up to the release of the, the latest book, which I'll bring onto the screen in a minute. Um, I, I've been keeping a real... Oh, great. Hold it up for us to see. <laughs> the light isn't the greatest in here, but yeah. hopefully... Um, and it's all... over on the subject. I'll see if I can bring that up a little bit here on the uh, Halloween color. Uh, <laughs> yes, white estate fraud, and uh, it's available there on Amazon as well. And people can find you if they go to authorstevedaily.com as well. But what I've noticed in um, following your thread, which is a, I think you put it up something up every day, and um, what I've noticed is that I have scrutinised every comment. And I cannot find anyone that actually tries to defend, um, to refute your claims. Right. I just attack <laughs> you. And uh, have you had a spill off of that, Nancy? Have people been mean enough to um, try and criticize you as well? Or have you, has Steve taken the brunt of it? <laughs> well, he's, he's taken most of it, but there have been people that have said some pretty nasty things at me. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, Oh, anything. <laughs> yeah. How do you know? <laughs> yeah. And look, even if, let, let's say that you are both totally wrong and Carrie uh, totally uh, wrote a book that was exactly accurate and Arthur White had nothing to do with it, I'd <laughs> still be upset at the way the Adventist apologists approach this kind of material. Like I said before, ad hominem attack and... Uh, constantly plaster the the airwaves with material that's just trying to criticize and not address the actual issue. Absolutely. So, Nancy, um, just yeah. tell us a little bit about some of your memories of your grandma, Carrie Johnson, and uh, how you came to kind of be a little bit suspicious uh, as to the accuracy of this book. Well... Um, I didn't read it till I was 20. And when I read it, I thought it was just not quite the right thing in, in the uh, front of it, it, where it talks about 
Well, the very front. Um, the forward. Um, it it lies in there, and and I just had I just could not believe it. How how in the world did this start out with lies in it? Mm. And um, I just left it. You know, I didn't worry about it. I was still an Adventist. I was. You know, it, was, it just didn't matter. And then later on, I found um, Ken Wright's book. And I hadn't ever seen it. I'd heard about it, but I hadn't ever seen it. And I, I had to read it. And when I read it, it made me really upset about my grandma. Mm. But nothing really happened and then a little later some people were telling me about it uh, and they wanted me to do something they wanted me to to have a i don't know a, a what do i want a book a book mm. and i'm not somebody to make a book <laughs> and um just my parents were um, very uh, secret, secrecy, secret, secret, sort of secretive mm. about what they were doing. Right. And after Grandma died, they wanted to redo the book and and get it out there, and um, but they didn't tell us that, and I didn't know what was going on until much later when I started realizing what they had done. And um, there was just too many things. Um, and one of the things that I've got here tonight, I've got piles and piles of stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, I have a friend, uh, Phil, what's his last name? Phil, Phil Harris. He, um, he got, I don't know how he knew who I was, but he started talking to me and um, he had been, he had been going through everything, every little thing that was going on. And he found so many things. Let me see. Um, shoot. There is where is it? Well, uh oh. Um, anyway, I got one that I want John to read for you, or a couple of them actually. I think it's just cut your volume off there. Here they are. Your sound has gone down, Nancy. It, your name, yeah. My sound went down? Yeah. yeah. Your sound is very low right now. Just maybe pull it a little bit closer to you there. Can you, is it better now? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, that's it. That's good. Okay. Okay. So um, he and I were going back and forth and um, let's see. What was his name again? Um, Phil Harris. His dad or his great, great, great grandfather, I think was a was an uh, SDA um, preacher. And so his whole family was that in that. And um, let's see some of I've got three of them and I like them all. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna have Don. That's these are these are the two I want. Um, okay, he's going to read you this one. This is from Phil. Phil Harris writes, "Good morning, Nancy. Having finished reading Dowdy's book, one thing I learned from his book is that he knew of your grandmother's intention of writing a book about D.M. Canwright as early as 1960." 
yet she didn't really know much about the details of his life. This means the Adventist organization and or your grandmother were planning such a book on or before 1960. So much for your grandmother's claimed vow of secrecy. <laughs> the Harris family historian and genealogist, I was amazed to read the ironclad documented detail of Ken Wright's family that Dowdy included in the early chapters of his book. Dowdy knew of your grandmother's claim, did the research, wrote and published his book in 1964. Now I understand that everything that Dowdy wrote leading up to grandmother's claim of being Ken Wright's secretary was documented proof that anticipated the lies she would be telling in the book that finally came out in 1971. Mm -hmm. One thing I do find amazing, but not really surprising, is that the SDA people don't seem to have a rebuttal to Dowdy's book. <laughs> at, least, at least I have found nothing online of that nature. Also, the Review and Herald had seven years to include a rebuttal to Dowdy's book when they published her book, yet didn't do so. Absolutely. Your own testimony of how you witnessed the writing of your grandmother's book would simply be the nail in the coffin to finally put it into the graveyard of false history. And he wanted me to do that. Um, wow. Can I ask a quick question, Nancy? And, and, sure. and then please continue. This is fascinating. When I interviewed you way back, Mm -hmm. um, you were mentioning a guy that you didn't want to mention his name at the time uh, he was yeah. ailing. Is this the guy? No, no. Uh -uh. Okay. He, that guy is um, the one, I'll tell you who it is. It's um, Abraham Tarion. Right. Um, and he, I've got a, a whole thing here that he talked to my parents about my, um, about my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was the one that supposedly uh, that she had confessed to him before she died. Right. And um, so he, when I found him, that was that was before I ever found him. I found him. It, it was about three years ago, two years ago, something like that. And I, I looked him up and I found him and I uh, asked him about my grandma and how he, um, you know, what he had, he had done for her. And um, I asked him um, if he knew that they had been disfellowshipped. And he said, no, I didn't. He said, I wondered why they never put their, you know, they never got, um, you know, yeah, he, he didn't, they, they weren't, no, I can't find the right word. They, um, they were not part of it. They, they weren't members. Right. And so they had been disfellowshipped. Yeah. And he had not. Yeah. And that was quite a ways before. Um, so he's, he, um, I told him, well, did they tell you why they were disfellowshipped? And he said, no. And I told him why, and it was because they had, um, they had got the money out of the church. Oh, they misappropriated some of the money yeah. uh -huh. from the church into their own funds. Yes. Wow. And and so from that, what I needed to know from him was if they had been um, re, re and, he, and they weren't. So that means that all of the times that the church has been calling grandma the, um, you know, that she's a, a good standing. Right. 
You know, they're lying. Yeah, yeah. They know it. Absolutely. So, mm. um, anyway, I've got more, but. Yeah, have- keep bringing it out. Keep bringing <laughs> it out as you feel like you want to. Just go for it. And Steve, cool? while Nancy's just looking there, you uh, you shared a link or sent me a link or someone did of a um, a camp meeting where some Adventist oh, yeah. leaders wheeled <laughs> carry out, uh, yeah. and that was a fascinating uh, document to listen to because she was lying the whole time. Yeah, and she was getting more and more into it as she went and. And they were steering her, weren't they? And and she seemed to enjoy, you know, the oh, the, the, the the stardom that she was receiving. So you're suggesting that even that time when she was being wheeled out to camp meetings, that she had already been um, disfellowshipped. Oh, she was di- disfellowshipped. She and Grandpa, in probably, I'm guessing, either the late. 40s or the early 50s right and um so that went on they didn't go to church anymore right when i was five when i I was five years old and we were at their house a lot and they didn't go to church and i would ask them why they weren't at church oh they were sick they couldn't do it you know and so um they did not go to church until after her book came out and then she would go to church so everybody would come and come around her yeah oh look at how wonderful you know Uh, steve what what time what uh period do you think arthur saw the opportunity to well when when she approached him at 1950 uh you know they the reason they say it was 50 years that she waited was because it was 50 years from Ken Wright's death, you know, till uh, when the book was actually published. But it was obvious that it wasn't 50 years because she was telling Arthur White about this story in 1950. So yeah. that, that had only been 30 years since Ken Wright's death at that point. So, you know, it's like everything else in her story. It changes. It, it's all expedient. It, it's all whatever needs to be said to make people believe. And uh, none of it ever adds up when you look at uh, the facts behind it, the evidence behind it. it it's really quite ridiculous, you know, how, how she came up with this idea. Oh, I need to, I need to pretend to be Canwright's secretary is a very <laughs> interesting thing to try to figure out. Um, you know, I, I think clearly she shows that she was a high funk. Oh, well, not even a high-functioning. Arthur White was a high-functioning sociopath, but uh, Carrie was really a low-functioning sociopath. She was not uh, a clever person. She was uh, a psychopathic liar, basically. I mean, pathological liar. She she lied constantly. And, um, you know, she would basically do whatever she needed to do to try to elevate herself and use others in that process and um you know somehow i I think it was probably because she realized she had access to arthur white and she put two and two together hey i have access to arthur white and i was alive at the time when canwright was alive so i i everyone else is dead now so i can tell arthur white that i was a secretary and um and she pulled it off you know only because Arthur White wanted to believe it so bad. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think Arthur White figured out very quickly, hey, this woman's full of garbage. Uh, she doesn't know what she's talking about <laughs> because uh, he saw that what she said didn't make any sense, especially about the peg leg and all this kind of stuff. Uh, she she basically revealed that she was a fraud, but Arthur wanted it to be true so bad that he decided to, uh, you know, play along with the fraud and, and basically enable the fraud. And uh, he really authored the book himself. When you read her book, the history, the stuff that's put in there is just clearly Arthur White. She didn't know anything about Adventist history. She wasn't a student of Adventism. 
She didn't know really anything about Adventism. It was Arthur White that had to start putting in this filler. And he realized, hey, she doesn't have anything substantial based on experience to put in here. So we're going to have to steal a diary or do something. And so it was really <laughs> Arthur White pulling the strings to try to get some personal information into this book that would supposedly, you know, fit with her claims. And the can the uh, can write diary was really the best bet they had. So I, I'm sure he put Carrie up to meeting with Can Wright's family and stealing that diary. And then they colluded together as to how to uh, pull that theft off, you know. And uh, Carrie said, oh, I, I gave it to the White Estate. It, I don't have any power over it. And Arthur said, no, it's her property. We can't do anything with it except keep it for her. So they colluded to uh, pull off this theft. And uh, knowing full well it was a theft and knowing full well that uh, only by lying about who it belonged to could they maintain the theft. And that's exactly what they did, even though the other white estate people were all saying, oh, yeah, Arthur will give this back to you when he hears the facts and stuff. The truth was he was the one behind the theft. So he had no intention of giving that diary back. And if it hadn't been for Dowdy, my belief is that Carrie and Arthur would have made up the most outrageous claims mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and based them on the diary. But it's only because Dowdy was able to go in there and read it himself that that really tempered their plans to. But even, you know, even if you listen to her, her interview and even if you read the beginning of her book, she's still making claims about the diary that are 100 percent untrue. She's still attributing things to the diary that are 100% lies, but she gets away with it because it couldn't be proven wrong. Dowdy wasn't allowed to take any notes. He wasn't allowed to make any copies. So no one could prove that they weren't getting this stuff from the diary, but Dowdy did know in his own mind from reading it that they couldn't. And he had published in his book that there was nothing in that diary that could hurt Canwright. So they had to really pull their punches in terms of what they were planning on doing with the diary versus what they could actually pull off doing. And where's the diary now? It's in the White Estate at Andrews, as far as we yeah, know. If you're lucky. Right. <laughs> they, may just, they may have destroyed it by now, you yeah. know, especially when this book comes out, because this book is calling them to... Uh, do the right thing and return the book to its proper owner. And it proves that they have no right to have the book. And it, it was 100% stolen and stolen in a premeditated manner. Have you chatted to the, the family, to the Canwright family you know, really, and tried to encourage them to make an official, Hey, we it's want really to interesting. I did do some research and I even had some help on, uh, studying into the Canwright ancestors because I wanted to get one of them to endorse the book. And what I found out was that Canwright didn't have that many heirs and the heirs he did have were extremely successful people that had nothing to do with Adventism. You know, they, they were remarkably uh, well accomplished, very wealthy uh, people that are very hard to get a hold of. Um, and it's obvious that they've put Adventism in their rearview mirror and don't give a rip about it because they've become very, very successful people in the world. So I, I don't think that uh, any of them probably have any interest in Adventism. Mm. Mm. And I couldn't even get a hold of them to talk to them. I did email them and never got responses from them. But, but these are very prominent, successful people. And so... Uh, I think the best revenge for them is success. You know, they became very, very successful and they don't need Adventism or want Adventism or, you know, they look, they probably just look down their nose at Adventism as this worthless cult that mm. mistreated their grandfather. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the diary should go to Nancy, really, because yeah. the United States has falsely <laughs> claimed that it belonged to Carrie. Therefore, so if they're going to mm -hmm. follow through on that, 
then they should be giving the diary to Nancy. Mm. And she's the one who wants it. She's the one who should rightfully have it. Mm. Obviously, if if any can write came forward and said, we want it, then that would be great. But I, I don't anticipate that that will happen just from the research I did on the can write family. Mm. Mm-hmm. Nancy, have you put in a, a claim for the book, uh, for the diary? I did send a, a letter to the um, white state not not the state no estate and i this was several a number of years ago and i asked them where it was and and i asked them if i could see it and i asked them you know it's it's it doesn't belong to anybody there so i'm the next one Mm. my dad is dead so i'm the next one they they never came back to to it they they wouldn't talk to me that, that you just you can't get them to talk to you yeah especially that yeah we should just have tons of people on the thread and stuff write them letters yeah good idea <laughs> action on their part on that's behalf of it, nancy page yeah that's what we need to do you know and just embarrass them into doing the right thing because we they, well, they, can, they don't care it. Yeah. They don't they don't care if they're embarrassed. They don't care. Yeah. Hey, I'm everyone, I'm talking to Steve Daly and Nancy Page. Their new book, I'll just bring it up onto the screen there, is called The White Estate Fraud. Seven day Adventism Scandalous Untold Story. And uh, we're talking about uh Canwright's secretary, Carrie Johnson, who was Nancy's grandmother. And this book was used to discredit Canwright. Uh, I'd highly recommend people go and buy um, the, there's two main books that I know of with Can, Canwright. Um, uh, and, well, oh, gosh, mental blank, what they're called. Uh, what are they? No, you, the, you mean Norman Dowdy's book? No, no, the Canwright, yeah. actual Canwright books. The Adventism Refuted, is that? Oh, the, yeah, yeah. And, um, and there's one on Ellen White or something. Life of Ellen G. White. And yeah. I do have the Dowdy book here, The Case of D.M. Canwright. Right. So in, in this book, what you're saying is that when he mentions, uh, he doesn't actually mention Carrie by name, does he? There was some reason. No, not by yeah. name, but he identifies the one claiming to be Canwright's secretary. Yes, yes. That's pretty clear that he's talking about her. Right. Now, at one point, chatting to both of you, you can't remember which of you said uh, that, she may never have actually even met him or even been a, his secretary. Never. So tell us about that, Nancy. Yeah, that's both of us. Was, was she there? <laughs> was, was she there though? Was there some point of time where they intersected where she might have been in the cafeteria when he walked through? He apparently just broken his leg or something. And could that have accounted for this this peg leg no, theory that nothing, she had as well? Or nothing, nothing like that happened. And the thing is, um, um, what's his name? It's Canwright. Canwright could not have been there probably the whole time she was there because, for one thing, it was snowing. It was the the uh, trolleys were not working, and his his um, wife had died that morning. That she said she met him, and that's been established. Steve, you've been able to oh, fact yes, check yes. that. Yeah, absolutely. It's documented. So she died that mo- his wife she, died the morning she claimed to have met him, which yeah. if, if if it did turn out she did meet him that day. That would explain why she said he was appeared to be kind of grumpy, and uh, of course you would be if that was the case. But you're saying oh, that that didn't even happen. Read Absolutely. your book. The, yeah. the, just read the book. It, she she tells all that stuff. Yeah. She, um, I've I've done all kinds of stuff to find out if it was possible for her to have seen him. And there's not a single thing wow. that possibly would do that. Mm. She, she could not have known him. For one thing, she 
she can't even, t I mean, she would go to his, his kids and, and she'd say that he had this or he had that and they're, they're going, no, that he's our dad. No, he did not do that. No, this is not right. And she would just keep on bullying them, but she was wrong. The oh. whole thing is a, I don't know. It's, can you read yeah. that? Don, Don's got one to read for you. Thanks, Don. <laughs> Phil. We've Oh, so, yeah. so Don's going to read one more thing from Phil. What's Phil's Phil last Harris. name again? Phil Harris. Right. Phil Harris. Okay. And, and someone has also asked um, asked Nancy if she remembers anyone else privy to a confession. Yes, and I can't remember his name, but I think you guys. I think you knew when you were asking me the last time. Yes. Um, well, I I remember knowing the Abraham. Terrian name and also yeah. George Knight as well. George Knight, yeah. yeah. But I don't think George Knight, according to um, the other guy, that that I don't think he knew her. I don't think he knew grandma. He just he right. just was talking about it, but I don't think he knew. Right. So what's Don got there for us? Phil Harris writes. Last night, a revelation suddenly came to me. Ken Wright had done so much research for so many years that led up to writing his main three books and other publications. It is obvious that he had been doing all of this from his own home for a very long time. Everything needed to dictate any such new book existed in his home research center in Grand Rapids. Therefore, he could not have nor would have dictated to a stenographer in any other place other than in his own home in Grand Rapids, 64 miles from Battle Creek. A stenographer simply records the verbal words that are being spoken by someone. To do what your grandmother claims, Ken Wright would have to have been reading from a handwritten manuscript. This is silly because if Ken Wright had a manuscript with him, he didn't need a stenographer. What happens next may have included converting a handwritten document into a typewritten text, but it doesn't appear, based on your grandmother's lack of typing skill, <laughs> she could have done such a thing, nor would she have been needed for that task. Being a very educated person, I am pretty sure he had his own typewriter for this task. After all, there is no other explanation for how he produced the first book, which is far larger than the two your grandmother claims to have been a part of. It is nonsense to claim that Ken Wright would leave home on the very day of the death of his wife to do what your grandmother claims. There is virtually no documentation concerning your grandmother's claimed knowledge of Canwright. As claimed stenographer, she doesn't explain how she would come to know all these things about Canwright. These facts alone are enough to discount any of her so-called claims about Canwright, whereas Canwright documented everything. Dowdy's book also has everything documented. If this yeah. issue were to ever end up in a court of law, it would be a sorry day for Adventism for Absolutely. ever having published such a piece of trash. Yeah. The real, instead of what was claimed, obvious reason to publish this book when the Review and Herald did so is that Canwright was so long dead, there was little possibility that they might be sued for libel by his descendants. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that that um, camp meeting audio, um, they really start going off the rails towards the end of it, where she yeah. starts talking about seeing an evil mist surrounding him, and and she's trying to kind of really establish this evil demonic thing. I just want to quickly read something from uh, the case of D. M. Canwright, um, which is, when when was this book released? Sixty four, and and. What's and when and and um, the I was Canwright secretary came out in when 70? 71. 
so this stuff was known well before the release. Uh, yeah. And so Dowdy writes um, in, a, in Chapter 14, Can Write Secretary, uh, in the letter received on June 22, 1960 from the Adventist leader who collaborated in the writing of Questions on Doctrine, who would that have been? Arthur White. Oh, so Arthur White was involved with Questions on Doctrine. Oh, yeah, I've got that too. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, he said that Canwright's secretary, along with others, had taken an oath that he had often said, I am a lost man, I am a lost man. Although, na although the name of the secretary was withheld, we now know it was... Carrie, I later discovered her identity when she began to correspond with Jess Canwright and Clinton Day. So what's who's Clifton Day? The, the son. Canwright. Right, on the other side of the family, right, yep. Seeking information about Canwright. They shared the letters with me. Um, then on April 6, 1962, I wrote to her asking if we could meet to exchange notes on Canwright. I had no reply, but on a Saturday, the Adventist Sabbath, she and her husband called at our home and remained about seven hours. Yeah. So that's an interesting insight as well. Like she's wanting to talk about it and just kind of have a great conversation. Yeah. Um, and she's enjoying that limelight. Uh, while my wife took notes, the secretary poured out a stream of what uh, purported to be information about and reminisce, reminiscences of Canwright. She gave a sketch of his life which contained most of the charges current among Adventists and added a few of her own. She told us of her association with him in Battle Creek when, as an old man, broken in health and fortune and living on the charity of the Adventists, which we, which we know wasn't true as well, uh, he employed her as his secretary in writing a number of things, including the life of Mrs. E.G. White, um, wherein we have been able to check her statements with official records. We have found them almost entirely inaccurate, but worse mm. than her inaccuracy was her subtle disparagement of Canwright. True, she conceded that he was naturally kind and affectionate, even a lovable man, but she represented him as dominated by an evil spirit in his testimony against Mrs. White and Adventism. Yeah. And I, I read that because it, it's it's shown that this information was out there, fact-checked in the early 60s. Yeah. Why do you think um, it didn't rise up way earlier than your book that you've both written? Well, Why didn't this stuff really see the light of day before they now? They threatened Audi and his book was taken off the market because they were oh. threatening him with libel suits. And he wasn't a rich man. He he couldn't stand up against the whole denomination of lawyers. And uh, so they intimidated him and threatened him. And, um, you know, they did the same with Can Wright's family. Um, wh what she did was just so despicable, you know, and, and I'm really thankful that she was as stupid as she was because <laughs> uh, had it not been for her. criticizing your family there, Nancy. <laughs> hey, they, can, I mean, they can have them. They had it not been for her stupidity, we would have had no proof that she never met Canwright. Yes, and and that's an interesting point because because she loved talking about this in the limelight. She spoke yes. so much that it, it, invariably she kept revealing little hints yes. uh, that you could follow. All they kinds of little hints, even big hints. But then there was the absolute killer, claiming to her Canwright's own family and to Dowdy himself that she knew that Canwright had a peg leg. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the thing that buried her because he, uh, he never did, did he? Yeah, he he never had the peg leg. There was a rumor and there was another person in the Canwright family who had had a, a leg removed from a hayfield accident, but it wasn't DM Canwright. Interesting. And, uh, so what happened was when she got this bright idea to make up the story, she started doing research. And then, you know, she, she uh, wasn't a great researcher, to say the least. She had so to she reverse got, engineer it. She got some false information. And then she went around speaking as if it was her first hand life experience, basing it on false information. Yeah. So that's what did her in, you know. Dowdy yeah. knew she was a fraud the moment she claimed Canwright had a peg leg. The family knew she was a fraud. All the ones who had known Canwright. Knew she was a fraud. Mm. 
And Arthur White at that point then knew she was. He would have had to know as well. So yeah. At that point, you know, uh, w became a codependent definitely in terms of covering the lies, covering the fraud. And uh, really, he became the author of the book yeah. himself. And uh, of course, he always attributed it to her. But she had no ability to write that book. But no. And uh, it was obviously written by Arthur. And he wrote the preface to it and didn't sign his name. Uh, you know, oh, really? So, oh, yeah. It's pitiful uh, how how he hid and and collaborated with her for 21 years. That's a long incredible, time. Incredible, yeah. And you have Wait. to ask, why does it take 21 years to write a tiny, thin book? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. because he had to go back and rework all the lies she told him <laughs> and invent all new stuff. I mean, it's he, had, just he had to keep putting out spot fires. Right. In, in the right. Dowdy book, there's only eight pages on Ken Wright's secretary, but he talks there about his wife taking notes, and it's a seven-hour catch-up. Yeah. Do we know where those notes are? I don't. I don't know where those notes are. Uh, I would have, assume that the Dowdy estate would still have them. Right. So we've got lots of uh, detectives and investigators that watch. Yeah. So we've got two jobs. Send messages to the wider state saying, on behalf of Nancy Page, we want you to release the diaries to her. And two, let's find out where those seven hours of notes are at the Dowdy's estate. Yeah, that would be a fun thing to have. Yeah. Well, we've got Don great investigators here. <laughs> Don has another one with the, the Dowdy part and a yes. little bit with me. Read it. What I had to say. Yes, please. Dowdy writes, here then are two dozen instances of misstatements on the part of Ken Wright's secretary. I have others on hand which I have not introduced because there was no reason to do so. But now the reader may draw his own conclusions as to the value of this woman's witness against Mr. Ken Wright. She has declared him to be the very opposite of what those who knew him intimately and over long periods declared him to be. At the mm -hmm. same time, she has made claims for herself as a witness that are totally insupportable. She has even resorted to deceit in order to procure data, which she hoped would assist in her disparaging him. Mm -hmm. And throughout, she has revealed her inaccuracy and multiplicity of details on the circumference of this of his history. Yet this is the part cited by one of the authors of questions on doctrine in order to discredit Canwright. She told me in my home on May 5, 1962, that this author had written her repeatedly for data on him. When I wrote yeah. to him, that I had discovered uh, about her unreliability, he professed to have no need of any information she possessed. <laughs> Documentation which I had sent him on the charges he had made, apart from her testimony, he ignored. Impartial men can judge the morality of such procedure. And then there's my, my what I wrote. Nancy writes, I am almost positive that this unknown party was Arthur White. Dowdy knew him well. The fact that he sent his research on, a fault, on the false claims of the secretary to this unnamed party makes a strong case that it was Arthur. Arthur most likely wrote most of Grandma's book because she could not be trusted to finish it or to offer any kind of scholarship in her writing. She was sick most of the time. It took her more than 10 years to, to finish it. And I suspect he knew she had made up the entire story. There is not one single photo of her with Canwright, no documentation of her existence as a secretary. No one remembers her. She claimed that all Canwright's letters, pamphlets, and books, which she said she had taken from his office in Battle Creek, were conveniently destroyed in a fire in her dad's house. Mm. She had stored them for three months after she claimed to have become the secretary for the conference president in the Illinois conference. 
Mm, thanks, Don. What some people say, oh, look, this is just hearsay and you're going off what other people say and um, where's the actual in writing evidence? But to have no one remember her being there ever documented, that's pretty big. What what yeah. other what other really factual empirical uh, empirical data do you have that that is more than just than the hearsay? I mean, really, none of it is hearsay. Nancy was a first hand witness. Ted was a first hand witness. Uh, Dowdy was a first hand witness. Mm. Canwright's family were all first hand witnesses. They all documented what occurred. Uh, Carrie is the one who has absolutely no evidence to support her claims. Uh, yeah. So if you're going to talk about who has evidence and who doesn't, yeah, you know, you, you compare Dowdy and Canwright to Arthur White and Carrie, and you couldn't have a more uh, ridiculous comparison in terms of integrity, mm. research, being careful. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> And, and is she saying, is her claim that she was studying there at the time and someone, but there's like, there's no record her, even of her being on any, on any school records or nothing uh, attendance I, records or. I just looked at that today. Yeah. She, I don't think my, my brother and I both think that she didn't ever finish um, the, no, no, the. Um, what you the school the school that she never finished and um, then she comes in to um, Cornell she calls she calls Cornell's thing the um, the business no no the Cornell business um college or something right um when it's really called the short shorthand um you know it's a shorthand in school well she she has at least two or three um things that she says this is what it was well you know one day it's one thing one day it's another one day it's another of whatever she calls that and um i don't think i mean the more i the more um i start into this again i don't think she ever went to the um shorthand um like school yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't think she ever did go there because you, you i've got her her um Man, you all over. Yeah, and and she couldn't she couldn't do very well, that's for sure. And um she uh she well, I don't know. I need a whole list of all the things that she said that were wrong. And oh, and like when when she was um when they were in the thing that you said where she, she was um they were asking her questions and stuff and they asked her about ellen white and she said i didn't know her i i never knew her mm. well how can you be what she says she is and she never knew the the woman that's in charge of all this mm. Um, and in, in, in the actual book, sorry to interrupt, but in the actual book, does she make a claim that she was his secretary for what kind of period of time? Seven well, minutes. Seven in months. In the book, seven months. Yeah. That's that's how long in the book, but in um, Dowdy's um, interview. interview with her, she had, I think it was up to... Three well, different time periods, two years, right? Year and, right. and then it kept getting less and less as as he could prove that Proof. she was lying. Yeah, as he's going, oh, but hang on, wouldn't that have been winter and you would have been over in that part of the world or whatever? Yeah, then it got narrowed down to seven months as the, the, the most official. time they could possibly claim 
that couldn't be absolutely proven to be false. Right. <laughs> how? How? Uh, what year was um, Arthur White born? Do you know off the top of your head? Oh, Just out of interest. I had it. Where was he born? Uh, he came in head of the White Estate in '37, and I'm trying to remember how old he was then. Um, I looking at that today. you can easily find his birth date there if you yeah. just right can i just read the first paragraph of of the chapter one so i'm just yes. missing the preface and the forward but um i mean i want a couple of ask you a couple of questions when i've read the paragraph mm -hmm. uh, so this is allegedly carrie johnson writing now on thursday morning january 2 1913 at 9 30 so she's very specific about that I, in a formal way, met Dudley M. Canwright. He was a man of 70, 72 years. I was 18 and an advanced student of Cornell Business College in Battle Creek, Michigan. The school was situated in the heart of the city on the second floor of the arcade. arcade. On this particular morning, W.E. Cornell, so, who is the owner and director of the college and a former Adventist, approached me in the typing room. I was afraid he was going to ask me to pay my overdue tuition bill or leave school. Uh, instead, he asked whether I would become an employee of his, and if so, he said he would cancel my bill. So it, has, has there been any record of um, the those invoices and overdue bills and them being cancelled? Or she, she No. Because if she wanted to confirm that she was there, she could have produced that kind of information. Two, two things. She, um, I don't think she was there for one thing. Um, at Cornell at all. At Cornell at all. She said that he had told her when she started that she wouldn't have to pay until she was at the end of, of you know, I don't know, however long she was there. And after she left, she says, and she was in a, in a different place. She says that he sent her a, a um, he sent her a, a, what do you send in the, bill? No, yeah, he sent her a bill, wanted her to pay for it, and um, she said because she had done all that for um, Canwright, that, um, that, she shouldn't have to pay him anything, but she would send him a dollar. <laughs> and and um, she, I don't think that he would ever do that, but I have his, I have Cornell's, um, it's, it's all about him when he died. And it was telling all about him. He was never, he was always an Adventist. He never left. All right. He says that he did. So she made that up. And um, and he was known when, when some young person needed help and couldn't pay for it, he would pay for him them, himself. So when she says that he wanted money and she gave him a dollar, that's a but she she put that up in her head so because she couldn't produce any of the letters nothing and and her her siblings have never talked about her until after she had her her book um i don't think my parents knew anything about it for a long time and um i don't i, I don't think she has a single thing from when she was 18 that can show that she was even there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to bring up just a few quick comments and things as they, they're pouring in. And I like to keep a bit of, keep in touch with what our audience is writing. Uh, so I'll just go right back to the beginning. We've got George Tishi. This is expected to be a great interview and we're at an hour in and it sure is. Thanks for watching, George. Um, I some of these I can't know I don't know whose names are associated so remember if you're watching from Facebook please add your name so we can um, bring up who wrote the comment 
this uh, was just reading Judd Lake's Ellen Under Fire in preparation for some content. We're all classified as Canright parrots. Do you, know what, do you know what that's referring to? Um, that's what they say of any critic of Ellen White, that they're a Canright parrot. parrot. Uh, oh, actually, it's Miles Christian. Thanks for watching, Miles. Um, answering Adventism is Miles's podcast. It's a great uh, channel there. Highly recommend people go and check it out. And um, and we've got Bev Seibold has just written, received my book today. Thank you, Steve and Nancy. And, of course, we're talking about this book here. I'll just bring it back up again, The Wide Estate Fraud. And this is by Nancy and Steve, my two special guests today. Steve, uh, you you were talking about your uh, other book earlier, which I just want to give a quick plug, the Ellen G. White a Psychobiography. And uh, that's uh, certainly a, a really fantastic read as well. So um, let's keep reading a couple of these posts. Um, this is Carol. Boy, my, I need new glasses. Um, uh, Carol, is that H-U-H-S? Watching from H-U-H-S, yes. Yes. Hey, Carol, good to see you watching again from Kansas City. You all look fantastic this evening. So excited to hear your interview. Thank you very much, Carol. Appreciate that. Now, Russell Schultz has written, um, Steve's work on the legacy of Ellen White is so well documented. His is a contribution we should all value. We can blink, but it won't go away. The, look, the, what are your thoughts there, um, both of you, but um, on this idea that a lot of people say, oh, just let this go, let this go. But I, I don't think it's ever going to be let go of until the church addresses it authentically and honestly. Um, yeah. why, why, I mean, a lot of, um, you know, now what is it, 179 years since 1844 or something like that? Um, a lot of other churches, Mormons, less so Jehovah's Witnesses, but other churches are kind of going, yep, this was our history, and boy, uh, we had some dark moments, but here we are. Why? Why is Advent? Why do Adventists so almost conclusively want to define it and rewrite history and and keep painting this perfect little um, dynamic that obviously isn't so? Why do you think? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, there's no no doubt that Mormons have tried to cover their stuff up too. And oh yeah, <laughs> and Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, every cult that has a, a very sad history and foundation does that but but adventists you know don't even want to be called a cult they look down their noses at jehovah's witnesses and mormons and think they're so superior to these groups when they all came out of the same milieu they all came out of the same historical context they all had frauds for their founders they you know they're you can't be any more extreme a cult than what Adventists were. This doomsday end of the world, seven years shut door, the whole world's condemned. I mean, the stuff they were doing, the, the, the ridiculous charismatic extremes, you just can't be any more of an extreme cult than what Adventism was during those first seven years. And then they covered it up and buried it and lied about it and denied it. And, and that's really been the history of the church ever since. We have to cover up who we were. You know, we, we can't admit the truth. Mm. And, uh, and most Adventists don't even know the truth. You mm. know, and, mm. and when they do know the truth, if they have, hold any kind of position or something, they obviously can't admit the truth or they'll be gone. Mm. And so, mm. um, they double you down. Know, yeah, you just have this constant... Uh, like you said, the progressive left is really the worst in many cases because mm. uh, they know better. They're educated enough to know better. They haven't been able to refute the evidence in my book, but they just attack me, you know. And, mm. and the funny thing is they attack me with ad hominem attacks, and then they accuse me of attacking Ellen White with, with ad hominem, hominem attacks. <laughs> they don't even know what the word means. You yeah. Know? I was I reading uh, Reese's uh, 
Reese's uh, book review, and he talks about my relentless ad hominem attacks on Ellen White. Uh, he, he clearly doesn't know what the word ad hominem means. And he's attacking you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> everything I say about Ellen White, I give historical documentation, mm -hmm. source documentation. Uh, there's no ad hominem attack there at all. Yeah. Uh, yet he attacks me with an ad hominem attack. And then accuses me of attacking Ellen with an ad hominem attack. Yeah, yeah. that's the kind of stuff they do. That's just ridiculous. You know. Mm, mm. I had someone say, "Oh, if you, um, if you attacked my mother like you're attacking Ellen White, you know, I'd punch you in the nose," kind of thing. Um, and I thought, well, you know, my daughter, when she was about seven or eight, she she went to a, a camp that was run by Adventists, and um, I, I took weeks and weeks to to calm her down with some of the stories she was told that weekend about yeah. Ellen White and the last days and the the um, time of trouble and soldiers coming, dividing families, and yeah. I think, boy, that it, the what what you or I might say about Ellen White as a critique pales in to nothing compared to that kind of spiritual abuse. So he can, yeah. come, <laughs> I would suggest that uh, I'd bop him on the nose for, for supporting that kind of terrible yeah. behavior that systemically runs through the church. Yeah. If my mom did what Ellen White did, I'd be tempted to pop her in the nose, you know. <laughs> Yeah. What Ellen White did was just so abusive and so revolting. And then to attribute it all to God, that's that's just really tragic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's that to me is the, the worst thing. The claims that this is God whispering in her ear. Right. Uh, yeah. And Angela Lima has written. Um, and this was back earlier, Nancy, when you were talking about um, your grandmother being disfellowshipped. She's written, uh, wow, un unlike Pippum, she was never rebaptized. Uh, Pippum's <laughs> the famous guy that was uh, kicked out of the church for uh, very uh, unscrupulous, scrupulous, I can't even say it, behavior. And, uh, but he was rebaptized, apparently. So your grandmother didn't ever try and come back into the fold officially? You, you would have thought Arthur would have helped her with that. Well, you would think that, but um, when when I talked to the, the pastor and he said, no, I have to kind of take that, and he would have known. He, he dearly loved her. And if he had known that she um, had done what she did, and he, he won't believe it. He, he does not believe it at all. He, he thinks it's he just loves her to death. I mean, just, he just loves her and he won't talk about her. If I ask him questions. Who's so, that again, Nancy? The, who? That, that was, um, Abraham Tarion. Abraham. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. He loved Carrie. He did. He, and he, didn't he, want to say anything. Now he has since passed. Is that correct? No, he's still, oh, he's still going. As far as I know, he is. Right. Right. He um he Sorry. had something that that grandma gave him and I don't know what it was but he just thought she was like his mom. He wow. loved her and she had wanted him to do her funeral when she died. Well, when she died, um her husband did not like Harian and he had somebody else right. and that has hurt Tarion. it's it's hurt him for all those years wow and when i asked him about it he said can you tell me why he would do such a thing and i i just could not believe that but he won't talk about it yeah but he's also the one that that said she admitted that it wasn't true. Um, Is that correct? Which, which was not true. Uh, Abra didn't, didn't you say that Abraham had said about a confession? Like yeah. a deathbed confession? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that Carrie had made? Is that right? Or you 
Well, oh, yeah. I've got it right here. Don can can read it for yeah. you if you. Yes, please. And then I want to unpack a bit more about um, George Knight's influence on or, or thoughts on this as well. Yeah. Okay. The, well. We've so this got, is Abraham Terrian, is it now? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, um, let, let's just do the the. Let's see. I think it's just the back. You think just this part? Okay. Try this part right there. The, the short part. I've boosted Nancy's volume, by the way, viewers. Some people have been saying it's not loud enough, so just let me know if, if you can hear it properly now. Yeah. Let it be clear. This is uh, Abraham Terrian. Mm -hmm. Let it be clear that I have no intentions whatsoever, never had to discredit Sister Johnson. God forbid. She was a most honest and respectable person and her memory is dear to me and i am unhappy over what dr yeah. knight is dr spreading. knight is spreading oh i yeah. see right that makes sense now yeah so george knight's the one that said she did a deathbed confession or something yes he's the one that said that as i said it was only once while at andrews when i shared a little of this with a colleague and it was in the course of an academic discussion with a denominational historian who already had his doubts and questions about certain things in the book. Uh, and this was being written to your parents. Correct? To my parents, yes. Okay. I wish you success in having the book reprinted. I think that eventually the family ought to have a copyright to the book and should secure it by all means. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned on the phone, even a facsimile publication of the typewritten pages of the manuscript in your possession, even if scanned images on the computer, should be of interest to show where and how the editors change things as the case may be. You can place a copyright on the fact simile edition and when the original copyright time is up you can reprint the book even a handful of copies simply to renew and retain the copyright i pray that this book will continue to be a blessing to god's remnant church hmm. for your information i am not sending a copy of this letter to dr knight i will leave this for your discretion you may send him a copy if you want I wish Dr. Johnson better health. Uh, God doesn't forsake his children. Here's in blessed hope. So he pretty much defended her to the end then. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Well, I mean, she became like a big celebrity in Adventism. So it's not surprising that many people were unwilling to challenge her, but, mm -hmm. uh, we know the truth now. I mean, you couldn't possibly come out looking any worse than what Arthur White and Carrie look like after the evidence in this book. I mean, yeah. it's just overwhelming evidence, and there's really no denying it. I don't know. I don't know how anyone could de deny it or or attempt to uh, dismiss it. it. It's just absolutely overwhelming. And uh, what was George Knight's claim, the confession? That I don't know. Um, I've heard. Have you heard, Steve? I don't really know about that. Uh, it, it sounds like f from what was just read that uh, it was in a classroom setting. My guess would be this, that if there was indeed a deathbed confession, that's a very sensitive thing. You know, um, you're under strict confidentiality not to be talking about that. And if he slipped and said something about it and George Knight heard it and then repeated it, 
that would put Tarion in a very, very bad place that he violated the confidentiality of a deathbed confession. So I doubt that George Knight would just make that up. Although no. George Knight has made up things about me that weren't true. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put that in. Uh, I have emails from him that are just absolutely embarrassing to him that he ever wrote them about me. But, um, you know, I, I really find it hard to believe that he would just completely make something mm. like that up that occurred mm -hmm. in a classroom if it didn't occur. It mm. makes much more sense that Tarion would want to deny it with everything he's worth. Yeah. It's such a violation of confidentiality for him to have said anything that and, would be my and guess. because he loved her so much as well even if right. she did say something he wouldn't be wanting that to come out right absolutely but just to be clear that he he is uh suggesting maybe that george said that carrie had said to him abraham on her deathbed that she had made up the story is that the nutshell version of that. I have, I have not heard that before. I mean, no, I, I'm, I might be wrong. I'm just saying, is that what you guys are saying? Or the, is the confession about Canwright? What the comment seems to imply is that Tarion did say something in the presence of George Knight in a classroom setting that Knight interpreted to be uh, that Carrie Johnson did a deathbed confession to Tarion. Yeah, that's yeah, what I'm and so and wondering. so he ran with that and repeated it to other people, and then Tarion realized what a violation of confidentiality that was for him to say anything about that, especially in a classroom setting where someone like Knight could repeat it. So then he had to go into pure denial mode to try to uh, keep all that from coming down on him. Mm. That, that, Oh, I would understand. Yeah, and and I'm only saying that it may have legs because it's Terry and himself mm -hmm. saying right. it. I mean, Terry yeah. admits that something was said there. Mm. He's mm -hmm. admitting that mm -hmm. something was said in that classroom. Uh, so he's the one that would have said it, you know. And and he's probably very ticked that that uh, someone of George Knight's stature was repeating mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. he had to try to discredit Knight, but Knight wouldn't just make something like that yeah, up. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. You know, so something was said in that classroom <laughs> that implicates Tarion, and he's trying to deny it. I, I think that's mm -hmm. the best read of it. Can you yeah. ask him, Nancy? Well, do you want to... Um, Give him a call yeah. now. Just get, get him on the phone now. <laughs> <laughs> do you have his number? <laughs> so, yeah, I do. Um, give a, just give him a quick call. Yeah, I'm just having a chat with some friends. <laughs> um, Don can read you more of this because we didn't do the first yes. part. Yes, yeah, far away. Nice and loud, Don. Yeah. However, I should tell you in writing what Sister Johnson told me. Uh, let me see if that's the right place to start. I decided to write you personally since you initiated the contact. Once you began the conversation with a description of Dr. Johnson's physical condition, I was careful not to add to his pain as I talked with both of you on the phone. However, I should tell you in writing what Sister Johnson told me a couple of months before her death. More so since Dr. George Knight has already disclosed what I once told him confidentially in the course of a discussion between us at Andrews University some 10 years ago. I left Andrews in 1993 and have neither seen nor talked with Dr. Knight since. So he does admit to telling Knight that in confidence. Mm -hmm. but, we're, but we're not too sure what it was that was told, are we? That's the... No, he, he does... Um... I think on here he does talk about um that should have been maybe you should just keep reading that yeah yeah 
I mean, all of that is pretty much irrelevant because we have absolute proof that Carrie Johnson was a total liar and yeah. that the book was totally fabricated. Whether she ever admitted to it or not, mm. I mean, that's between her and God. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. but yeah. we know good and well it was a fabrication and that uh, the evidence is overwhelming that her and Arthur White did it over 21 years and tried to keep it secret. And Arthur White lied about it. He lied about his involvement in it. Um, you know, it's like grandma, like grandson. He, mm. he's, he's doing the same kind of deceptive stuff that Ellen White herself did. Mm. Well, she, With, sorry, go ahead. He said in here somewhere um, that he wouldn't say what she was upset about. She was angry. She was afraid she was going to die. And she wasn't going to go to heaven. Something like right. Do that. Right. Yeah. If you find it, we'd love to hear that. Um, just while you're well, looking. He, he's going to keep looking. Keep looking. Uh, and Steve, um, just bring out another couple of comments. This is Laura. And this is kind of a lot to do with what you were saying earlier. Uh, our, Laura Almiron. Hey, Laura. Thanks for watching. Um, you were saying that Adventists just don't know what's going yes. on. And she's written. And, and it's primarily because of books that you've written. She's become a member of, uh, I think it's the same Laura, of yes. our handwrite appreciation uh, Facebook group. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I talked about it on the thread. And uh, not knowing anything about Adventism is the big problem. I did not know all of these things until last right. January when I asked to be taken off the books. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and George Tishi has asked, Steve, do you think this time the church will respond to your book or will they just stay quiet um, like they did last time? I think they are fairly in love with that strategy of just trying to suppress and, um, you know, cover up and deny. And I, I think that's kind of their chosen strategy, especially when they have no answer for the evidence. The, the difference here is that not that many people loved Arthur White. Um, Arthur White was not liked by a lot of people. So I think there probably are people in Adventism who will say, yeah, Arthur White deserved to be thrown under the bus and we're not going to defend him here because the evidence is overwhelming. Um, it, it's, you know, Arthur White clearly doesn't have the kind of stature that Ellen White has. So you can throw Arthur White under the bus and no one's really the worst for it in Adventism. Whereas Ellen White, she's the whole, you know, bag of caboodle. You, you throw her under the bus and you got major problems with all these people paying tithe and the third world and, you know, the great controversy going out in billions of copies. And I mean, you got major problems if you uh, throw Ellen under the bus. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's, you know, both right and left are trying to salvage Elvin, Ellen. Yeah, I think you're right. And what, I, what has really dawned on me in the last week, I, it's been dawning, but it's like the sun rose um, with my last interview with uh, John Hackwell. And whether you agree or not or like or dislike his art, that's not the point. I believe people should have a chance to, to freely share their side. And I'm, I will welcome anyone that opposes his art to come on and have a chat about it as well and why. But what I realise is that primarily the defense, those that were upset about it were the liberal progressives. And yeah. what really began to shine for me was that they too, as much as the uh, more conservative traditional historicist Adventists, they too deeply love Ellen White in a way that I, I hadn't quite recognized before. I thought they've always seen her as an inspiration and maybe not a prophet, but a wonderful messenger and someone who uh, enhanced the Bible and they often refer to Desire of Ages. But I, I, I thought it was more admiration rather than a deep love that they really seemed, you know, they, they took it very, very personally that she was being ridiculed in some ways or mocked in this piece of art. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, let's just that take, surprised me. let's take SDA historians like Butler, like Graybill, like Gil Valentine. 
these people know the truth. I mean, Gil Valentine has written a lot about how gross Ellen and James were to all kinds of people in the church. They were just plain mean and evil in the way they treated people. So he knows that. So, you know, it's not really my perspective that people like Butler and Grable and and Valentine love Ellen White. I, I don't yeah. think that's the case. I think the case is they love their positions. Mm -hmm. They love their prestige that's connected to Ellen White. And if she goes down, they go down. You know, yeah. John's been writing a book for 40 years about Ellen White. So uh, it, if, if people really accept the evidence in my book, then it makes his 40 years of labor kind of a waste of time. Butler, you mean? Yeah, he's trying to, you know, show Ellen White as this mm -hmm. great but evil person at the same time. And, you know, he's trying to show all sides of it, but mm. he doesn't really want to deal with the real evil side that's demonstrated in my book. And, and I... Yeah, and that's a good point. And and you meant Butler, not Johnson. You said Johnson there for a Jonathan second. Jonathan Butler, yeah, Jonathan Butler, Ron Jonathan Gray. Butler. Oh, right. I mi I misheard that. Uh, and the I three, think they're the three Adventist historians that should be coming on and refuting me if if I can be refuted. But mm. they all refuse to do it because they can't refute me. Mm. That's that's the reality. Um. And I think where I was going to is I've kind of had an inkling about that with the academics and the scholars that are on the liberal progressive um, spectrum, but I, I, it's more the grassroots people. I didn't realize that that they had really bought into Ellen White as um, as Elvis. You know, just they just love her. Yeah. But I just didn't realize it was that kind of love. I thought it was more admiration. But but that interview just revealed to me and the backlash that came from it just revealed to me the this incredible passionate love they have for her and they they took it very very personally yeah um let's bring up his uh um this is a good one for you nancy john davidson said nancy you're a rock in the interview thank you for being brave I <laughs> <Yes. love it>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh someone else has written this is fellow human 7312 thanks a lot for this interview thank you for watching and deanna is uh watching as well awesome now let's see if there's some other questions here someone else has written the church will never address the issue they will continue in their delusional beliefs oh that's angela lima thank you angela and uh deanna has written it's truly time to accept the truth the real truth um i had a few people write to me this week that were anti the book and had some points and i've invited them to come on the program next week uh, whether they can or not i'm not sure if we can it'll be the wednesday time slot which is your tuesday 5 30. so mm -hmm. if i'll let you know if they do and you might be able to both be in the audience and 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 offer some comments up to the to the because that what was interesting is one of the first people i've come across that is trying to refute um what you're saying rather than attack you they were quite polite towards both of you and so i've invited them to come on the program anyway um so now this is i'll bring up uh, andre rias um oh and adrian thank you adrian for this i'll bring it up this is that historic recording i was mentioning oh it's got it's full of um uh <laughs> that'd be hard one to copy down <laughs> but uh it's in the link anyway if you're a facebook watcher click the link there that adrian's got and you can bring up um uh that recording we talked about of the camp meeting. It is fascinating to listen to. Now, Andre Rios has written, uh, what is it? Um, so guilty by association. Hmm. Let's not forget that Daly spent most of his life as an SDA. Smiley face. Any comment on that? And by the way, um, I'm, I've had Gil 
I've had all three of those on the show, Jonathan, Gil, and um, Grable. And um, I'm looking forward to Jonathan's book. If he's ever watching, I would love to read that. I think um, it'll be a good read. And Ron Grable's, I've read the two. What's the, the one he submitted as the for public well, the and, yeah. Yeah, yeah the dissertation and the admin yeah. release the two and i loved when i asked him about that i said well, how do you feel about that having the two versions <laughs> and he, he uh, the one thing i like about him is he's like oh well yeah it is what it is <laughs> kind of really like. and the thing with gil valentine i, I i've just uh, read his book on the canaries and mm. I, they're just like it regardless of where they're coming from why they may not uh, take it a step further like you have it, I believe that that work particularly that recent one by Gil Valentine for me is very important reading material I think Adventists need to be reading that while they, they also yeah and while they also read um, this book that's uh, released by the two wonderful people I'm interviewing today Steve Daly and Nancy Page go and get your copy The White Estate Fraud that's kind of what we're talking about today. Um, so I'm, what, I'm not 100% sure there what Andre was saying. And Let Andre, just, don't forget, I'll you're welcome on the show too. So right, what was that? he's saying is, you know, here I was an Adventist minister for 35 years. And I've been very candid about that, that, um, you know, my years in Adventism were blessed. Um, I had great opportunities, traveled all over the world. Um, my book, Adventism for a New Generation, uh, had very wide uh, spread influence. And um, I don't regret my years in Adventism. Uh, when I went into the Adventist ministry, it was to try to help the church change in more healthy, positive ways to become more gospel friendly, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it wasn't like I believed about Ellen White uh, then what I do now, you know, I, I mm. think if people understand research, they'll understand that even PhDs focus in, in a particular area of research and try to become as expert in that particular area as they can. When we write dissertations and that kind of thing, that doesn't make you an expert on all things. You know, Jonathan Butler tried to imply that when I did my master's degree on the 1919 Bible Conference in 1982 that I knew everything about Ellen White that I talk about in my psychobiography. That, that's just absolute nonsense, mm. total lie. It, it's simply not true. And, um, you know, when I left Adventism in 2010, I knew enough about Ellen White and I knew enough about the church that I could just no longer stay in it. But um, I didn't realize the depths of evil uh, regarding Ellen White until I specifically researched the question starting in 2016 of, uh, you know, the accusations of pathology and, and fraud against Ellen White that were made throughout her lifetime and after her lifetime. Will those stand up to historical and psychological scrutiny? It wasn't till I explored that specific question that I came to the conclusions that I wrote in the psychobiography. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people who try to say, oh, you're a hypocrite. You stayed in the church 35 years when you believed Ellen White was a fraud. No, that's not the case. Um, for many, many years, I thought she was a prophet. And then I gradually, as I taught more mm -hmm. in SKA history, came to realize I don't think she's a prophet. I don't think she was truly a prophet of God. But um, it wasn't until I wrote, you know, my last uh, two books after right up until leaving Adventism, The Prophetic Rift 1 and 2, that I made clear in those books that I no longer believed Ellen White was a prophet in any way, shape, or form. And uh, I left the church right at that point, basically. Yeah, and I, I don't get how people can't understand that one learns incrementally through life right i mean if you look at what i was saying on sda q a three years ago compared to now i've learned so much yeah um and it's ironic that that what they're trying to defend is 
um, like people who have had incremental education but are trying to reverse engineer so that they are trying to say that, no, what we believe back then is what we believe now in spite of the evidence, <laughs> whereas yeah. you're just being honest. You're going, hey, this is, this is what I've learned. Yeah, I did believe in her. Now I don't. And here's yeah. the evidence and here's the information. Right. And if you have Andre on, I have a question for him. Yeah. You know, and, and Andre, can we even invite Andre to come on for a minute just so we can have his face on the camera if he wants? Or, you know, we just for two minutes, Andre, if you want, let me know. Like write me a message. Uh, right. In the meantime, while he's pondering that, uh, far away. And my question for him is in his book review of my psychobiography, he accuses me of relentless ad hominem attacks on Ellen White. And I, I, my question for him is, do you understand what the word ad hominem means? Uh, it means attacking a person as their personhood apart from evidence, apart from documentation. Everything in my psychobiography is 100% documented, source documented. Uh, the historical evidence is overwhelming in the footnotes. I don't do one single ad hominem attack on Ellen White, and yet you accuse me of relentless ad hominem attacks. So I can only assume you don't understand what the word or term means to say something like that. Yeah, you, you're backing it up with the evidence. And uh, Russell Schultz has replied to Andre. Um, Andre, thank you. I've read your review, but I don't think that we can dismiss Daly's work. He's provided so much to think about. And uh, that's the thing. It's not like an ad hominem attack is just um, like Des Ford had so many attacks like that where they just like one right. one person just said, I wouldn't listen to him. You know, he's only exactly. skinny. He's a skinny man or exactly. a little man or something. <laughs> like, but where, exactly. where, so what? What? Where else? What else you got to say? Right. Uh, someone else has written. I thought it was funny. There was a little mistake they made that I thought was uh, actually more accurate. Uh, this is Dave Wilmoth. Thanks, Pete. I'm grateful that my grandkids know nothing of advertising. And then he's corrected it, Adventism, later. <laughs> I think Adventism is advertising. It's, it's one, it's thing, one right? big propaganda <laughs> machine. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, let's just, uh, a couple questions. Oh. Uh, Faye Johnson, SDAs are the remnant, God's last day church with a unique message for the world. Imagine what would happen if the leaders admit to the church's doctrinal issues. We'll take that as a comment. Rodney <laughs> Smith has written, Peter, is that you? Uh, you did not send me a heads up. You were coming. I apologize for that. I could let people know on Facebook, but those that watch on YouTube, I had no way of uh, knowing how. Mark Anthony did share with me for future shows that are at a different time on how I can let YouTube subscribers know. So I will next time. Sorry about that, Peter. Uh, Rodney. Um, and we've got uh, Paraku Posamos. I try and pronounce that every time, and sometimes I get it right. Uh, I'm so happy to have, ac have access to this amazing project. Thank you, Steve and Nancy. I will do everything possible to spread the word and promote the book, including a book review on my channel. Thank you. Now, that reminds me, Steve, we were going to uh, put it out there. Anyone that has a podcast anywhere yes. in the world that would like to interview these guys, um, you know, contact Steve on his website, which is called authorstevedaily.com. Authorstevedaily.com, yeah. Authorstevedaily.com. Or they can just contact me on Messenger on my Facebook page. Yeah, or whatever. yeah Facebook there. Uh, open to sharing interviews. Contact him. I did have a couple of contacts, but their podcasts have stopped. Uh, they were getting too much flack. <laughs> um <laughs> I'll read one more here from Faye. Can you imagine the devastating effects of the leaders admitting to the church's errors? That would be an even greater disappointment because the church's membership today is largely is larger in numbers. Largely in numbers too. Yeah, la yes. <laughs> wasn't that yeah? Wasn't that sad that, uh, with uh, Ron Numbers passing? Yes. Now, uh, since our last interview, uh, that book, Prophetess of Health incredible piece of work highly recommend people along with, along with reading your books 
Uh, I should and now they're them. treating numbers like he was a great guy, of course, when What's they that? treated him like absolute garbage when he wrote the book. Say, say that again. The I said when numbers died, they're all talking about what a great guy he was, but when he wrote the book. And I know. Academics and stuff were treating him like absolute garbage. Yeah. I remember That's in my first interview with you, I said something along those lines. I said, "Isn't it interesting that everyone was absolutely rubbishing Ron Numbers when the book came out, right. and he died a hero within the Adventist liberal progressive community?" Right. And you're yeah. saying uh, the same. You're mining the same uh, gold mine, but with a whole lot of new material, and um, that new material uh, is wrought upon you all this um criticism and genuine ad hominem attack yeah. um uh, but maybe that means that in uh, 50 years time all the liberal progressives will go well thanks steve daly and what a great uh, contribution you made to the adventist church <laughs> um now this is rodney smith brethren you cannot be saying that you can disprove the spirit of prophecy yep <laughs> Thanks, Rodney. Um, <laughs> this is for Nancy Margie um, Stubbins. Can Nancy please tell how her grandmother treated uh, her and her brother as opposed to the pastor's grand thoughts about Carrie? I'm not sure what that means. As opposed to the pastor's grand thoughts about Carrie? Um, pastor. Uh, I think your, your actual experience with your grandma. Yeah. She's saying, how did, how did she treat you as opposed, I'm not sure about which pastor she's referring to. Probably uh, me. I'm not, sure. <laughs> I'm not sure either, but um, we, we were not taken care of for, with our grandparents or our parents. So it was kind of, for us, we just grew up that way and that's the way it was, you know, we didn't, we didn't think there was anything wrong with that at all, but we were not fed real well. And we were, we were always in the way they, you know, we, we couldn't do things. We, they, you couldn't make them happy. And so as little kids, we would be kids and we would try to be happy and do what we wanted to do. And then we'd get spanked. So, I think I know what she meant because another comment came through later. How were you treated, which turned out not that nice, compared to Abraham that really loved her? What was the difference? How how come he fell in love with her? And I don't think he was a pastor, though, was he? Was he a pastor? He was yeah. a pastor. Yeah. So how, how come he had this? What, how did she treat him differently to you is what I think they were asking. She was able to turn it on and she had him completely uh, he had no idea what she was really doing what she really was and to him he just dearly dearly loved her and um so i don't know i <clears throat> i i asked him several times um you know, if I could ask him questions and things like that, and he said he didn't want to talk about it. So uh, he he was, I think he must know that there is a problem there. Um, but but he just loved her so much. I And I really don't understand why. Hmm. Maybe because she had earned that celebrity role. I know that Adventist pastors and Adventist grassroots, whenever there's a famous person around, they go goo goo gaga eyes. Yeah. Uh, George, Tish. you know, two things. She was a sociopath, so yeah. she was really good at buttering up people she wanted to butter up, which, of yeah. course, a pastor is going to be someone she wants to butter up. And then, of course, it's her later celebrity status that makes her almost an untouchable in Adventism. Mm -hmm. Because she's the one who brought down the terrible can, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nikki Carlton has written. And by the way, I'm just bringing up questions and comments. If you two want to be talking about other stuff, just go for it. Um, this is just a kind of, I like to 
try and keep a little bit in, in touch with what's going on in the comments if we can uh nikki writes ellen is part of our identity if you pick at her it's as if you are picking me if you chop off a limb it's like chopping off my limb if you prove her to be a fraud then i'm a fraud my whole life is altered and no, nikki's not saying that that that's how she feels she's saying that's how people feel yeah there. and there's no question a lot of people do feel that way mm. you know? and there was even a time in my young life when to attack ellen white would have been the most unthinkable thing a person could possibly do you know mm. so it's almost I, the way it's still the way now i understand that you know yeah. i understand a lot of adventists are coming from that place yeah. we have those apologists on the thread every day so it, it's that kind of mentality is not at all surprising and i understand it i, I empathize with it because there was a time growing up in adventism that that's the way i felt and that's what i was taught um who is this angela lima you should invite uh Randa Burisma to be interviewed about his book facing doubt adventists in the margins I actually did invite him when he was touring Australia recently, and I think he has been on the show in season two where we looked at um, uh, the Glacier View 40th anniversary, but I would love to have him on the program. Do you know Rainder at all, Steve? Yes, yes. I know of him more than I know him personally. And, and what's your take on his books? He, he, would, he would put some uh, questions over Ellen White. You know, I think he's a very thoughtful person. Uh, I, I don't ask that people agree with me. I ask that they don't just buy into a party line and buy into the Kool-Aid that uh, Adventists tend to drink when they are raised in the subculture. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think there are a lot of thinking people out there that are honest, and I, I think he's trying to be one of them. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed my interview with him, unless I'm dreaming I had one. I'm pretty sure I did. People sometimes say, well, um, you know, you should interview George Knight. And I go, well, I did. And then sometimes people say, you should interview someone else. And I go, I did. And then I find out I didn't. <laughs> but I did interview George Knight. Boy, it was, a, it was a very interesting interview. Was he pretty candid and stuff? What was interesting is it was about a two and a half hour interview. And for two hours, he kept saying, you're asking the wrong questions, Peter. You're asking the wrong questions. And it was quite heated. Um, and and I realized that the conversation was all about me asking him questions and him feeling he needed to defend the Adventist position, whereas he loves putting things in context. And then, you know, he doesn't like, I don't think he'd ever been challenged in an interview before. And I, uh, two hours in, I said, George, I'm view me as a street epistemologist. I like to know what you believe, why you believe it, and can you defend it? I want to know what you believe. Can you defend it? And he went, oh, right, that's what this is about. And then, then the last half hour was a fantastic conversation, and he was very candid after that because he realized where I was coming from. I'm, I wasn't trying to... Uh, get him to defend Adventism. I was trying to get him to to defend his own beliefs. Yeah. And so the last half hour of that's really <laughs> good interview. Um, uh, Adrian has written: um, Would Andre Rias and Steve Daly both be interested in having a, a live discussion together on SDA Q and A? Andre, would you be open to that? Steve, would you be open to that? My biggest reservation on it is that uh, I don't feel that Andre has been honest. Uh, we, we had a dialogue that was occurring on another website and George Tishi and some others were, were reading along and observing that. And when uh, Andre got the idea that it wasn't going well for him, he just deleted all the comments and that did not go over well with me or with a lot of the people who were reading that, and I just felt it was grossly dishonest for him to, you know, well, on our, way, kind of cover everything up when it's not mm, going. Well, way. on our platform, no one can delete the comments. Yeah, that that would at least be a plus. Mm. I, and we I, go I, live to about yeah. six platforms. I'd be more inclined to dialogue with him if he would answer my question about why he accuses me of 
relentless ad hominem attacks against Ellen White. I find mm -hmm. that accusation to be deplorable and asinine. He, he's just written, he's in his pajamas. That's why I can't come on right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Andre's got a sense of humor. So Andre, answer <laughs> that question. Don't hide in your pajamas. You don't have to come on live, but answer that question. Yeah. Uh, Mark has written, um, where's it gone? It was a good little comment. I, I used to get this one a lot. Um, in fact, someone said to me, that they felt betrayed that I had left the church instead of staying within the church to bring about change. And I said I would have betrayed my daughter if I'd stayed. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you want me to do, betray the church, which I don't think I have at all, uh, mm -hmm. or betray my daughter? You know, I'm not going to raise her in an institution that treats women as second-class citizens, right. uh, demonstrably so, just because of gender. Yes. Uh, so... Mark Anthony has asked, why not remain, preach, and promote the Bible and demote Ellen G. White? Nancy, what are your thoughts on that? And then Steve. What what does what are they asking? Uh, they're sort of saying, why don't you just why not stay and help to bring a lot of people that stay in the church think that they can bring Ellen White to a more balanced perspective. Um, why not stay and do that? And by the way, Steve and Nancy, have you taken your names off the roll? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I was yeah. just fellowship. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. My, yeah. When, we, when I left the Adventist church, I was just fellowship. Mm. Well, they were going to disfellowship me, and then they decided that they wanted my money. So uh, I said, sorry, I'm leaving. <laughs> and, um, but uh, I really have a heart for for Adventists because they're stuck mm. they don't, I mean most most uh, the higher up they are the more they absolutely know what they're doing but the people in the pew they think that's all they have to do they think that they're making God happy for what they're doing as and I just want them to know there's nothing you can do god has to do it jesus has to do it and that's hard to get them to listen to that yeah and look the reality is if you've been observing adventism since day dot um ellen white is not going to be demoted that is just so clear to me the church yeah. is not going to stay if you're a liberal progressive stay make nice little bubbles within it that you can hang out with your mates that's fine but don't trick yourself don't deceive yourself don't be deluded ellen white's yeah. emotion is never gonna happen yeah. um Le i wanted to ask you as well um i wanted to respond to that oh, you you respond to that because i need to bring up a file yeah. to ask you I mean, about i did my best 35 years trying to change help change the church move it in a more what's that book direction. you wrote you wrote a, a book adventism for a new generation that's that, right that did have a lot of influence on a lot of people so i did my best to try to move adventism in a healthy direction um when the time came for me to leave and them to disfellowship me and then to learn what i learned in the wake of that writing my psychobiography um, it would just make no sense at all for me to return to Adventism. And, um, you know, what I can say is in the 13 years that I've been out of Adventism, I've never been happier. Uh, I've been pastoring a church where we have peace. We don't have all this backbiting and criticism. And, you know, my 35 years in the Adventist ministry, every single church I was in had backbiting and criticism and gross po politics going on and mm. you know there was always this garbage going on and then the last 13 years pastoring graceway we're great friends we love each other <laughs> there's no backbiting why in the you know what what yeah. i want to go back to <laughs> Advent adventism's like this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I, I was coming along happily in life and <laughs> and then you kind of go past it and 
<laughs> it's just one constant piece of confusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I've been wanting to ask you, Steve, so I interviewed recently Brendan Paul Valiant, kind of became a pseudonym, but he and his wife were the ones who uh, found all that uh, E.G. White's stuff online that you, I think, used a bit in your... Um, Oh, they found what was hacked, you mean? Yeah, they were the ones that hacked it. Oh, they hacked it. They okay. hacked it and put it online. They're and not the, the ones being sued by the church. Yes, though. yes, yes, yes. Oh, they're the ones. They, they're yeah. the ones being sued yeah. by the church. Okay. Yeah, and now I've interviewed him a couple of times on totally different topics, and he said he's more than happy to come on and talk about it because that's been settled out of court. Um, oh, good, good. Uh, it, it, and I've asked him, and I, I think he sent me some information. But how? Just re recount. How did you stumble across that? You know what I think happened was uh, I, I know the history of how it was hacked in in 2012, and then from yeah, my that's, understanding, that's, that's the they were kind. At least the church claims they were trying to blackmail them uh, for money, and uh, that the church supposedly wouldn't pay. But in 2014, the White Estate came up with a bright idea of, hey, we can't do anything about all this stuff that's been hacked except we can put it out there ourselves yes. and claim we're doing it in honor of the 100th anniversary of Ellen White's death. So all that stuff became available because they then put it out there. So it was hard to know if you were seeing stuff because it had been hacked or if it was because the White Estate stuck it out there. But I definitely saw a bunch of stuff in 2014 yeah. that was held for me as a researcher, even when I was doing my doctoral dissertation dissertations and stuff which which was really unethical for them to do yeah now we're going to come back we have a we we try and have a little uh five minute break one hour or two hours in i've just had a bunch of private messages we we, we just quickly need a little rest break uh so go and grab a glass of water make yourself a nice hot chai latte or whatever uh, we'll be back with Steve Daly and Nancy Page in about five minutes. And Steve, in the meantime, and both of you, I want some quotes from the book, the new book, uh, if you can just get them, that ready. And we will be back in five minutes. All right. love me so much more than I could ever know Your love is deeper than this world will ever show And all of life's beauty shines around this moment now The sky and the cliffs, they seem to change my life somehow And I, I will never be, will never be the same Will never be the same Oh, 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 I, I will never be, never be the same, never be the same ever again. Well, here I am waiting, Lord, my life is just for you. Please unfold all the plans that you would have me do. And if all the world's just a breath, and nothing's here to stay Then all of the love we feel Will save us anyway And I, I will never be Will never be the same Will never be the same i 
thing, you know. Ah, and that's from my album, sure. which you can all go and listen to on Spotify there, Standing at the Cross. It's actually Peter Dixon Band. You can do a QR code if you want to take you there. Uh, or you can find it on iTunes and buy it and support what I'm doing. That always helps. Uh, there's a QR code for that as well. Support this stream. Uh, that really is super helpful. It's kind of my job now, SDA Q&A. <laughs> and uh, I love it. And uh, I'm simply trying to shine uh, a light onto Adventism, not necessarily the bad things. We've even got a small series we're doing now, five things I love about Adventism. People have been coming on and sharing that as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, love your support, and I'll continue providing this content. There's my PayPal forward slash Peter Dixon Music. I was 30 years a musician until lockdown. Now I'm a podcaster. <laughs> so I'm speaking today here with uh, Dr. Steve Daly and Nancy Page, and we're talking about their new book. Um, which I'm just going to bring up onto the screen. And it is entitled White Estate Fraud. And uh, what's the subtitle again? Seventh day Adventism Scandalous Untold Story. And um, yeah, fascinating book. I actually, you, you sent me the. Uh, the pre-release version on email there, Steve, and I, I found it absolutely fascinating. So, how did you both meet? Um, what, what kind of? Uh, I know you said it was kind of uh, through the social media world, but do you remember the the defining moment when you both reached out to each other, or who reached out to who? I don't know. I, I yeah. Once I knew who Nancy was, I was very curious to learn more about her and I did the interview with her quite a long time ago before I even started writing the book. Uh, and I found the interview quite fascinating. So that became an important part of my work in writing the book. And he, he asked me if we could, if we could do a, a book and I'm, I'm going, Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. He's going to do it. Yeah. Oh, fine. Yeah. I can do it. And <laughs> And he wasn't kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I and think, I think I had been watching him on his, um, you know, on the the other one before this. Um, what was your one before this? This was oh, the LG White a psychobiography. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought that was amazing. I didn't know anything about him. Never, never heard of him, but. I really loved it, and I would make little comments, and <laughs> and as he's he's you know giving us all this stuff, and and I said something about probably about my grandma and probably something about um, our favorite guy, um, Enron. Arthur, 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 Arthur. Oh, Arthur White, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that really got him. He goes, well, can you tell me a little more about that? I'm going, yeah, sure. <laughs> when, when did you um, read the Dowdy book? Do you remember, uh, Nancy? The, the Dowdy book, um, that was probably 15 years ago, something like that, maybe longer. I don't know. I I finally found it. I didn't know anything about it, and I got it. And just <laughs> I read I read it, and I sent it to my brother, and I called him the next day, and he said I said did you did you start reading it? And he goes I stayed up all night and read it. the The last two um, parts of that are perfect, grandmother. Oh my goodness. They he had her to a T. And we're going, who else would ever know who yeah. she's like? Mm. We mm. 
Wow. Did you ever set her down? And we're talking about uh, I was Canwright's secretary, um, Carrie Johnson, uh, that's Nancy Page's grandmother. Did you ever set her, <clears throat> set her down and say, hey, look, tell me about this book. What's going on? Did you ever you, have that conversation? You, you do not that. Can't do that to her. She right. would not take it. You, she's in charge. You are not. No, we lost I, I lost my you. volume there. Uh, yeah. You don't have any photos of, of her there you could hold up, do you? And uh, is there any oh, video? Well, on the book. <laughs> is it in the book I, inside here? It isn't. My, yeah, there are pictures in there. There's a picture. Oh, here we go. Right at the end there. Yes. Um, right next to the uh, the gravestone of Canwright. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you, you have her on video in that video interview she did. Yeah. I I, th I thought that was just an audio. That one. No, there's a video no. too of the yeah. camp. Really? You love, you love her face when she's doing that. Oh my goodness, she is just in. Oh, she loves it. <laughs> no, it's all about her. It's not I didn't, about I didn't know that that was a video. Um, there is yeah. a video, yeah. Oh, boy, if someone can post that in the comments, I'll look forward to watching that a bit later. I just want to... It's in my book. I have the link to that video interview that... in, in oh. this book. Oh, good, good, good. Well, I, I've got the email version, so I'm, I'm about to download the... Um, the Kindle version, as soon as we finish this interview, I'll be buying it for sure. Um, yeah. And I'll have access to links. Now, I'm just bringing up Rodney Smith claiming I've made a deathbed confession, uh, but I'm not deathbed yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, he's saying to someone else, he hasn't called them names. It is there that Peter would say that I've won the argument. Smile. Rodney, you did not win the argument. I'm not coming back to Adventism. I did an interview with Rodney. Uh, yeah. Rodney gives Peter... Uh, a Bible study. And it's funny, people thought, oh, that means Peter's considering. No, it's just like, um, you know, I know for sure there's uh, what's, let me, there's a kind of food. What's a food I don't like? Uh, anyway, think of a food I don't like. I know I'm not going to eat it, but if someone wants to give me a, you know, a study on why I should eat it or not, I'm, ha I'm open to that. That's what was the case with the Bible study. Sorry, Rodney, there will be no deathbed confession. I want to make that clear right now. So in 30 years when I leave this mortal coil <laughs> or 10, um, yeah, there will be no, I wish I'd gone back to Adventism. I'm just saying that publicly as a statement. Uh, okay, Kent, share us a few things from the book. Uh, maybe read a couple of quotes or pick a chapter and say this is the title and this is what it's about. I want to just uh, spend our last half hour together just chatting about the book i don't have mine yet so. I, I have it here uh, there are three main characters of course carrie johnson arthur white and uh of course can write himself and mm -hmm. so let me just read a few here about each uh one at least one of each uh, carrie johnson in contrast to arthur white was not a high functioning sociopath but exhibited very common sociopathic characteristics typical of someone with an antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality and sociopathy are often used synonymously, but a high functioning sociopath demonstrates other unique qualities. We will unpack what a high functioning sociopath is in the next chapter when we look at Arthur White. But in the remainder of this chapter, we will conduct a mini psychobiography of Kerry Johnson looking at the prominent historical evidence that has been documented in this book with some additions and its relationship to antisocial personality disorder. Then I just go through the characteristics, disregard for right and wrong, um, persistent lying or deceit uh, mm -hmm. to exploit others. She was very good at that. Callousness, cynicism, and disrespect for others except the one she wanted to impress. Use of charm and wit to manipulate the one she wants to manipulate. Arrogance, a sense of superiority, extreme opinionatedness, which Nancy was just talking about. Recurring problems, including 
some criminal behavior. Of course, she stole church money. Um, she would lie and cheat to get things. A repeated violation of rights of others, the way she treated her own grandkids. So there, there was a lot of stuff there that uh, fit with Carrie. Uh, talking about uh, Arthur, um, let me just say this. Sociopaths in general, including high-functioning sociopaths, rationalize and justify their behavior so that they believe they are almost never wrong and almost never truly need to apologize. They basically function without a conscience no matter who they hurt or how many they hurt, to get their way. In Ellen's case, she was able to rationalize plagiarism, literary theft to destroy people's lives with testimony she attributed to God, exploit church members for money, commit other forms of hypocrisy, deception, and fraud, all in the name of God. Arthur was also guilty of plotting and committing evil against those he considered to be a threat, while denying bold face that he had any involvement in such activities. Again, he never seemed to confess any of these actions, repent of them, or even show any evidence of ever feeling guilty about his dishonesty and cover-ups. In his mind, no one knew what he had done and he wasn't about to tell them. A mm -hmm. um, couple things about Canwright. Um, Let me see here. I'm just going to read. So like his wife, James was quick to steal the thoughts and ideas of others without giving them credit. And by this time, Canwright had also witnessed firsthand the whites financially fleecing and exploiting church members for their own personal gain in a manner that had raised major concerns about the integrity of their leadership. Footnote. So they were not really in a mood to be scolded and lectured by the whites during their Colorado getaway. And yet that is precisely what happened. James and Ellen did not feel their underlings were showing them the proper reverence and honor they deserved as founders and co-founders, co-founding prophet of a movement. And the dispute between James and Dudley seemed to trigger uh, what launched into a barrage of criticisms that had clearly been escalating in the prophetess for some time. As soon as Canwright and Lucretia, his wife, cut their stay short by leaving, Ellen started writing a massive testimony that judged and condemned them both without mercy. 25-page uh, thing that had didn't have one piece of evidence to support what she was saying, just ad hominem attacks. So. Finally, um, Kenwright never confessed any desire to return to Adventism in any way, shape, or form, despite SDA's false claims to the contrary, which have all been debunked. Kenwright's two books, Renouncing SDAs and Ellen White, had a great worldwide impact exposing Adventists, which continues to this day. Kenwright's book on Ellen White was published the year of his death, proving that he had never changed his mind about her. Canwright's legacy was so great that, as we've already shown, a main street of his hometown was named after him. What a contrast to the obscurity Ellen White had prophesied and SDAs had falsely claimed after he died. Mm. So, a few of the quotes, but that's great, <laughs> and and no one can deny there's so much data there, so much evidence that. Can Wright was just disparaged left, right, and center. Yeah, completely. And he was such a great guy. Yeah. That's the amazing thing. You know, yeah. he was the one that wanted to leave the church, have a truce. And it was the Adventists who were so stupid that they just deliberately violated this truce in the Review and Herald repeatedly. Mm. If they had not been so stupid, they would yeah. have saved themselves everything that's come because of Can Wright. But yeah. They made a ridiculous choice. He was happy just to quietly go about his business. Yeah. And uh, like you said, by all accounts, he was super well respected in his church, his community, Absolutely. much loved by family, friends. Absolutely. He kind of went on to live the kind of life that you're living with your, um, the church you're pastoring. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a whole different world than Adventism. 
I actually, I often get people write me uh, emails and messages saying, how can they watch you live in that context? It's on my Facebook page every week. Yeah, okay. We so, broadcast the sermon right on my Facebook thread. Yeah. Okay. So anyone who wants to see it can. Can just do that. Okay, good. And Nancy, did that bring back some thoughts to you on uh, on some of the, the damage that was caused against his reputation, against Canry's reputation by your grandmother? Well, um, she, um, she purposely... Uh, I mean, he was dead. She purposely was trying to make him look as bad as she could. And she lied about him. She lied about other people. Um, she, it, to her, it was just fine to, to do that. She didn't think she was doing anything wrong. And, mm, wow. and um, for instance, when when she was trying to get the the di the the diary, she um, she came home. I I think she tried more than once because she would come home from visiting one of the uh, can write can write can write people and um she'd be really angry and then when she got it she came home just like she had oh my goodness she was so happy and then even though i think it was the i don't know if it was his son or his grandson but had called her and asked for it back and she wouldn't answer them. I mean, she was just terrible. Then she gave it to um, Arthur to White. Arthur and Arthur, of course, well, it's not mine. You know, I don't, I, I don't have to give it away. I, you know, he was just an idiot. And, um, those are those are the kinds of things you could not trust her at all. Yeah. Arthur White was sly like a fox, trying to act like he was innocent through it all. But he's mm -hmm. the one that thought the whole thing up and That's made right. the agreement with Carrie so that they could both protect their own hind ends and and deny ownership when you know they were both lying. It's it's just a sick uh, scenario. Now he came. He came to her house, and this is when I was five years old, all the way up to twenty years old. That he would come to their house, and he hated kids, and he he would he would just tell her to get the kids out of the way. You know, mm, they quite gruff. <laughs> oh, he he did not like us at all and we got to watch all of that we got to watch him telling her what to do yeah. and <laughs> he, he just was he would have it his way or no way mm. and she did it her way or no way <laughs> interesting and duo i've yeah. got the i've got the papers where she had done it the way she wanted it and the next time you see it it's been mixed up and it's not the way she had wanted it. Yeah. And, and she, it just, it just made her so angry. Yeah. Arthur White was just an evil guy. You know, when the 1919 transcripts were discovered in, in 1974, he took custody over them and would not allow anyone to see them. He kept yeah. them captive in the White Estate withholding them from the church, withholding them from scholars. Uh, it was only after he retired from the White Estate that those transcripts were leaked to Spectrum. So, you know, Arthur wow. White, he was just an a-hole. I mean, he, he would he would do anything. He was mentored by F.D. Nickel 
who was a, a very dishonest apologist, very mm. smart guy, very a hundred times smarter than Arthur White, but he was also like a dishonest lawyer. And mm. uh, he's the one who mentored extreme conservative. He's the one who mentored Arthur White and Arthur White never was a brilliant person himself, but he would just parrot Nichols stuff. <laughs> and then he, uh, you know, he was the ultimate cover-up man. Anytime information, Butler, Grable, all these guys talk about it. Anytime there was information about Ellen's phrenology or whatever it was, he would lie about it, cover it up, try to withhold documents. He withheld documents from numbers once he saw what numbers was doing. I mean, it's just a sick, a sick guy. Mm -hmm. What's that book there? It's mi mirror imaged around the wrong way. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Ellen G. White, Messenger of To the Remnant. To the Remnant. Yeah, and that's Arthur Arthur, White. Arthur White. And he's got, this was for Grandma. He's got his, his uh, signature. signature on there. And um, it's, it's just full of craziness. Wow. Is that available online, that one? I, yeah. Is yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I've I got have the book. What was, um, was your, oh, and uh, Mark Anthony has just asked, uh, I think he's misunderstood. Uh, Nancy is not a distant relative of Ellen G. White's. Uh, yeah. She's the granddaughter of Carrie Johnson, who wrote this book. I was Canwright's secretary. Right. And uh, we're discussing the new book by, Dr. Steve Daly, and with the help of Nancy Page, uh, I'll, I'll bring it up again on the screen. Um, oh, got the wrong, there we go. I'll just bring this up again on the screen. We're discussing this book, and um, no, it doesn't want to come up. Can you hold your copy up again for us there, Steve? Sure. We're, we're uh, discussing this book Uh we get it up in the light there. There we go. Oh, yours is mirror reversed as well. <laughs> the wider state yeah. fraud. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's what we're doing, Mark, and we're having a good discussion about it. We're going to wrap it up very soon. Uh, I want to thank you guys so much for your time today. Uh, we're, we're kind of hitting record viewership again, which is great. Uh, as we were talking about George Knight before, he was kind of the – the record for live viewers. I'll have to see when the dust settles after this, but over the five or six platforms is quite a number, which is great to see because uh, not, the, not that it's all about numbers, but it's great to see that this is an interesting topic that people want to engage in, whether they agree or disagree with you guys. So please yeah. put your thoughts in the comments. Uh, but I wanted to ask, uh, sorry, go ahead, Steve. I was going to say one of your questioners asked me what I thought of George Knight. And, all right. Uh, you know, I was just going to say, he, he's not really considered a historian in, in Adventist academics. He got his doctorate in education, and he's written kind of popular history. So he's not really considered a, a true Adventist academic as far as a historian's concerned. I don't have anything against the guy particularly, but some of his emails written to people on my thread where he just completely trashed me were exposed. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he hated that because I saw the stuff he wrote about me that he was trying to conceal. And uh, I lost a lot of respect for him by a lot of the, the lies and stupid things he said about me. But, mm. so you know, I don't, I don't have much to say about him one way or the other. But I did find those emails to be quite ridiculous. Quite annoying. Yeah. I, I was going to say um nancy was your grandmother did she have charisma about her? was there something that kind of stood out when she turned on the charm you were saying before maybe she'd done that with abraham um uh did you notice that she had this charisma that kind of people would sort of react to her as a bit of a bit of a star or was that only after the book came out that that was generated um i'm trying to think uh she she it's, had a way it it, it had to stand out from the crowd i guess is what i'm yeah. yeah it had nothing to do with the book at when i was you know a lot younger 
um, she would get somebody to do what she wanted and they wouldn't even know that she was, you know, should have done it herself or whatever. She was, she was very good at getting people to do what she wanted. Interesting. Even if it was a lie. I mean, she lied about me. I was, I don't know if I can remember all of this, but she was in charge of the, um, now see, I should have been ready for this. The temperance uh, thing? Or? The temperance thing. Yeah. And, um, and she forced me to uh, be one of the people who, one of the kids who, um, you, you, you had to tell a, a story. And I was sick. I was, I was my, I was hot. I was sick. I could hardly walk. And she would not let me go home. She made me stay there. And wow. I did my little thing. And at the very end, I got the, the gold, you know, I, I won. I know I didn't won, but she, she did that. She stuffed the ballot box, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. She, she did that to people. She would, she didn't, I mean, I could give you a lot, whole lot more, but she was not somebody you could um, trust. She could mm -hmm. really butter up the people she wanted to butter up. Mm -hmm. Treat other people mean and yeah. revolting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. She was That's even to her, own, to her own siblings. She would be that way. That that Hulk, all of them, they they were always fighting with each other. <laughs> now I'm going to close in a minute. Uh, I need to race off and pick up my beautiful daughter Renee, and. Yeah. Uh, We've had such a good conversation. I'll just bring up Carl Wagner, who's going to be back on the show very soon. Uh, he said he read the book Adventism for a New Generation in 1997. And he was asking at the time, I kept asking you, Steve, as I read the book, why you haven't left the church? I see, see you finally <laughs> did make that decision. And uh, so any closing thoughts that either of you would like to make? Oh, hang on. We've just got a couple of other ones here by uh, by Carl, which I'd like to bring up because he had a lot to do with Walter Ray and uh, was his lawyer. So I've had, wow. a, I've had an interesting interview with Carl previously and we're going to get back into it. Um, so, Carl, shoot me a reminder. I want to make a time very soon. Uh, Walter Martin was given free reign at the White Estate during QOD. After his first run-in with Arthur White, he told Froome that he will not deal with that man again. <laughs> and uh, Froome got the stuff for him. Arthur read his grandmother as scripture, as did many circa 1920 and today. Um, yeah, so what are some closing thoughts that you would like to bring to the table? We'll start with Nancy, and then Steve will give you the last word. And uh, just once again, a quick plug for the book. I'm going to just try and... Nancy, you start talking while I try and bring it up on the screen again. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've, we've covered so much ground. I, I love the uh, conversational style of our chat today. This is the new book we've been talking about. And it's called The White Estate Fraud, Seventh-day Adventism Scandalous Untold Story. As soon as the interview's done and I've picked up Renee, I'm going to come back and buy my Kindle version of that. And, um, yeah, if oh, people are yeah. interested, I'd highly recommend that you do so also. I, I just um, had a thought. Um, and now it wants to go away. <laughs> Shoot. Um, there have been a number of people on, um, S Steve's site that have, they have just gotten out or not even out yet. And they suddenly understand 
and they are they are just eating it up. They want to know what what's so different from being an Adventist. And they just, I've had a number of them come to me and say, if I hadn't heard this, I would not have left. And those are the things I just love what Steve is doing. It's it's just it's just so wonderful when you get somebody in there who suddenly they've been kind of nasty and then all of a sudden they get it. Mm. And I I just love that so much. Mm, that wake up moment. Yes. Mm, yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Just before you respond, Steve, just want to quickly bring up as comment Adventist analyzer. Ellen White was also kind and cruel, depending on the person's stance to her prophetic authority. Yes. Dr. Alan Davis, who I interviewed last week or the week before. Good to see you, Dr. Daly. And uh, good to see you too, Alan. I uh, loved our interview the other week. Fantastic. Steve Baxter has just written, the white estate fraud showed up in my mailbox yesterday. Yay. Yeah. And uh, uh, Angela has written, thanks, Pete. I enjoyed this interview. And uh, Rodney Smith has just joined us. He's a regular. And oh, no. <laughs> He's no <laughs> different Rodney. Hey, Rodney. He's just uh, replying there. He's been going a little bit sidetracked there on the, on the uh, comments. And uh, Carl has just written, he's ordered his copy of the new book. Fantastic. Someone else has written, got my copy. This is exciting. Uh, Arthur Klim's watching. Arthur Klim wrote that, got my copy. Arthur and I will be doing uh, two, maybe three interviews on um, the Fred Veltman eight-year study. I cannot yes. wait for that. That's going to be great. great. So we might get. Uh, if, I'll let you know, Steve, if you can be watching. Uh, okay. And we're gonna. We'll try with Andre for an interview next week. Closing thoughts there, Steve. And thanks. Yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, high functioning sociopaths are classically very gifted at buttering up the right people. Um, they they can be considered very loving and caring and just wonderful people to one group while they're miserable and evil. And, you know, both Ellen White and Arthur White were high functioning sociopaths. I have no question in my mind about that because they had this two dual personality thing going on. And, um, you know, a lot of people just thought they were wonderful, but then there was the reality side of the evil that was just overwhelming and the deceit and dishonesty and, you know, in Ellen's case, the plagiarism and the, the condemnations all attributed to God. I mean, she really went to the extremes, but, um, you know, someone asked if, if I'm out of the country and we can't get Amazon, yeah. how can you get the book? Um, just message me on messenger. That's probably the best way. And, uh, and I'll, I'll talk to you about it. We'll see what we can do to get you a copy. That's and great. Uh, what was what was the last thing I was going to say? Um, it seemed like there was one other comment that uh, I wanted to. Yeah. While you're looking there, I'll just quickly bring up a couple of thank yous while you're looking back there, Steve. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve and Nancy, for exposing the lies and fraud related to the Adventist Church. What's the next book? <laughs> Good one. Yeah, next, my next book is Why I Left Adventism, and we're we're going through that right now on mm -hmm. my third. So. And uh, yeah, have you found that other one? I think that was it. I think that, that was it. What 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 one am I doing right now? Oh, good. Well. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your both your busy schedules. I've really enjoyed our conversation today, and I know that our many viewers have as well. And there'll be lots of conversation going on over there at YouTube and Facebook. Go and look in the description, everybody. You can find links to all sorts of goodies down there. And just one last quick plug. If you are enjoying uh, my content, 
Uh, I'd love a little bit of support over there. You can QR code that, or you can go to my PayPal and make a donation. It really helps, as this truly is my main source of income now. And um, don't f oh, if people want to contact you, Nancy, I guess they can on Facebook as well. You're often mm -hmm. in the in the thread yeah. there with uh, with Steve. Yeah. And um, last quick plug. Uh, standing at the cross, my gospel album, the music that's been playing, uh, not at the beginning, but the music in the middle was from that album. Very yeah. mellow, mellow album, and that's free on uh, Spotify. Well, guys, until we meet again, and uh, I'll look forward to chatting with you guys in future. I've loved this. Thank Live you, long Peter, and for all you do, and be Thank sure and let me know when you're having. Uh these people on that are going to uh, criticize the book i'd love to listen yes to what their yes criticisms are. i'll uh, i'll I, I literally made a note before when we were talking about it on my phone to make sure i chase the guy up his name's kenneth uh if he's watching kenneth contact me um i'm going to try and make that happen sooner or later and andre rios I reckon we could have a conversation here that won't be deleted, won't be edited, the, the comments won't be removed, and uh, we'll have a nice civil conversation if you're both up to it, but we can talk more about that. I'm still waiting for Andre to answer my question that he never answered. Which one was? Oh, yes. that Yes. But, he did say he answered about the ad hominem somewhere in the comments there, but I couldn't find it. The relentless ad hominem attacks that yes. he accused me of with Ellen White. Apparently it's in the comments, he said. But anyway, well, oh, it yeah. is in the comments. Uh, uh, apparently, um, he wrote to me pri on private messenger and said it's in there somewhere. Um, but there's so many, I couldn't. Make I looked sure back, I couldn't find. That. It. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you so much. Live long and prosper, and we'll see you next time. All right, thanks everyone Let's go. for coming in. <laughs>